Um, for those of you who don't know me, Dave Newhart, Yale Springs Historical Society President, uh, I welcome you all. Nice turnout for what is our first program since February of 2020. So it's uh, it's great to be back. Uh, unfortunately, I did that program too. So uh, <laughs> for those of you who remember that far back, it was in uh, uh, on Yale Springs Road, Miami Township Roads. I want to want to say that we're not only do we have uh, problems getting the projector set up, but we're missing one of our core board members, Becky Eshelman, who we lost a, a few weeks ago. She she was uh, a stalwart in the historical society, including our, acting as our web mistress, mistress, and she religiously put a new uh, blog up every week for years. And we're really going to miss that. In fact, we're still trying to figure out how to get on the on our blog to, to work on it. Uh, we do plan a full year of programs, our normal four programs this year. Uh, in addition to this one, we're going to have an open house of an historic house in Yellow Springs. More to come later in July. <laughs> then in uh, uh, September, September, right? Uh, Jocelyn's going to do a program on the mound builders focused on, on our local mounds. I know there was just a program um, here in town a, a few weeks ago uh, on the mound builders in general, but uh, she's going to focus on, on uh, particularly the, the mounds that are in the Glen and who built those and what their culture was like and what else was going on at the time. And then in mid-November, we're going to have a, uh, another program, this time on the Antioch College power plant. Now, we know that that's probably not long for the world, but I think you'll find it interesting to uh, the whole circumstances under which that was built, uh, built in a, a quarry, uh, and operated at one time Yellow Springs took its power from that plant, and uh, uh, there was a lawsuit with our uh, local utility over that, and uh, a whole lot more. So there's a whole long, interesting story about how that plant got uh, built. So uh, hopefully, again, uh, COVID staying under control, uh, we'll have a full set of programs this year. I'd like to take you back to the beginning of tourism in Yellow Springs. And you know, it's, it's funny because if you ask a typical resident, uh, there'll probably be some complaining sometimes about tourism. And they're certainly complaining about real estate speculation, but this town was really founded on tourism and real estate speculation. <laughs> so, you know, it's 200 years of complaining, I suppose. Uh, in 1800, the, uh, the population of the whole state of Ohio was only 45,000 people. And the state was just five years from uh, the the uh, Treaty of Greenville in 1795, uh, where the United States defeated the United Tribes uh, in this area of the country, and that opened uh, really what would be eventually become a stampede uh, to of my immigration to the state. Um, but just two years after that, uh, as this area we're living in now uh, was being um, surveyed and sold off for the first time, a man by the name of Lewis Davis comes into the picture. Lewis Davis was the son of a miller, Owen Davis, uh, but the signs of the times or the things of the times, he was into real estate speculation among everything else. And so his uh, father who had built the first mill, uh, grist mill in Greene County at what they named, I thought, think very correctly, Alpha, the first settlement in the county, um, uh, had decided that the pastures looked greener, or actually the falls looked greater uh, on the Little Miami, uh, at the falls of the Little Miami, at what is today Clifton. And so the whole family moved up here about 1802 and established a uh, milling operation on the, uh, the Little Miami, but at the same time, Lewis Davis was, was beginning to uh, engage in real estate speculation. And one of the, uh, the properties that he bought was what we now call 
or I refer to sometimes as the Yellow Springs tract. And that's the tract that has the Yellow Springs. And this is, this is about what it consisted of on uh, uh, a modern map. So the western part is, is today's, the heart of Yellow Springs. The eastern part is what's today's Glen Helen. And the northern boundary was the, uh, the uh, section boundary. So this was section 14 and part of section 20. Section 21 and 15 are just to the north. And the reason he was interested in this, in this was because of um, something that was located on the property, the springs, which were, even at that time, in 1802, uh, believed to have medicinal, um, medicinal qualities. So in 1804, just two years after, again, he's, he's into buying and selling property. He sold it to... Uh, man who happened to be uh, his uh, 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 father or uh, brother-in-law. Brother -in he married uh, uh, Louis Davis's sister. And this was um, a man who, in this picture, he's <coughs> dressed as a banker because that's what he had become. Uh, but uh, he had been uh, a fighter on the frontier. Uh, with Simon Kenton, his name is Benjamin Whiteman, and Benjamin Whiteman uh, also settled in the Clifton area and built the stone house that's now on North River Road. Uh, so, so Benjamin Whiteman bought the property with the springs on it just a couple of years after uh, Davis bought it from the government. He may or may not uh, have built, uh, Davis may or may not have built a, a cabin there, we just really don't know. But there had to have been one there by 1804, because Whiteman, who's also into real estate speculation, he doesn't really want to uh, operate the property, uh, leased it to a man by the name of Thomas Frame. Frame. And we know Frame was there early on, because in 1803, or excuse me, 1804, um, the same year that he leased it, the uh, Greene County commissioners uh, granted a license to hold, to open a public house at the Yellow, yellow or Medicinal Springs. Mm -hmm. And it was really the first tavern license granted that we have record of being granted by the township trustees. Green County had only been formed in 1803. So in 1804, they're granting to frame the right to, um, to open this uh, and operate this uh, public house uh, and in 1804, he advertised. So he had something all ready to go, and he's advertised in the, or, or it wasn't really like a formal advertisement, but it was a mention of it in the, the Cincinnati newspaper, unlikely, or likely because uh, uh, Freem had, had pushed it a little bit for um, uh, this medicinal springs which the, that report said had 10 or 12 patients there. Well, we're lucky in that in 1805, just one year later, and still really early by Ohio history standards, uh, a man by the name of uh, Josiah uh, Espy visited the Springs and specifically stopped because he was from Cincinnati because he had a brother named Hugh who was having some some allergic reaction type problems, skin problems, and so they stopped to take advantage of the medicinal, medicinal, excuse me, medicinal springs. And Espy left a, um, uh, a diary that tells a little bit, I'm gonna read from this a little bit, but I think it's worth, worth hearing the story. Um, during my stay at Mr. Mitchell's, who was on the Little Miami uh, south of here, our happiness was in great measure destroyed by the indisposition of my brother Hugh, who on the day I first met him at Thomas Espy's complained of a slight attack of the rheumatism in his left knee. Here it became painful almost to distraction. On the first intermission of the pain, and as soon as we could with safety, we started for the Yellow Springs, about 16 miles higher up the country, where we arrived on August 21st. These are the most celebrated mineral waters in Ohio, 
and beginning to be much frequented, again, this is 1805, um, they are situated about 70 miles north of Cincinnati and about a mile and a half west of the Little Miami. The country around them is more hilly and less fertile than usual in that state, but it may be considered pretty well calculated for wheat. The, uh, the Yellow Spring is a beautiful, bold, and limpid water issuing out of nearly the top of a hill about 80 or 90 feet high, the country back of the spring being nearly on a level with the ground at the top of the hill out of which the spring issues. Down the face of this hill, the water flows in rapid descent to a beautiful brook below, Yellow Springs Creek, leaving a sediment or deposit nearly the corner color of half-burned brick, which has accumulated to an amazing size. It is indeed the greatest curiosity in the neighborhood. The face of the hill or projection composed entirely of this deposit is from 50 to 80 perches in circumference and is in its center from appearance 30 to 40 feet deep. From the small quantity which this spring deposits in one year compared with the immense size of the mound, the man of science will find it difficult to reconcile the scriptural account of the time of creation, according to common <laughs> computation, with the number of ages it must have taken to produce this little mountain of mineral earth. To me, it is another evidence of the great age of the world and that biblical chrono chronology has not rightly been computed heretofore. The face of this hill on which the sediment has been deposited appears incapable of producing much vegetation. A little shrubbery, red cedar, the chief which grow on it. I do not know whether any experiments have been made to ascertain the quality of this deposit, but judging from its appearance, I would suppose a good paint, something in the nature of Spanish brown or yellow ochre, might be made out of it in such quantities that would be sufficient to supply the whole Western world. <laughs> the, the water of the spring is intensely cold. It has not yet been analyzed, but it is supposed to be strongly impregnated with iron, something copper, and cal, uh, calcareous earth, and I observed on its surface a dark, oily substance in small quantities. Considering the intense coldness of the water and apparent hardness, it is surprising what quantities may be drank with perfect safety, it usually operating as a diuretic, sometimes as a cathartic. <laughs> it is now most used in rheumatisms and eruptions of the skin and with great efficacy. The situator, situation around it, yet nearly in a state of nature, is capable, in other words, there weren't too many people in the area, is capable of the highest improvement, the beauty and convenience of the adjacent ground being almost unequal. At present, the only convenient improvement of the piers is two excellent shower baths, which are much used. My brother and I remained at the springs only three days, during which time he felt himself better. But on the day after he left there, the pain in his knee became excruciating, and he was again confined at the house of an old friend of our father's, in the name of David Mitchell, about four miles from the springs. Who, this, this has nothing to do with the springs, but I think it's worth hearing what the medical practices were like who humanely prescribed some poultices from the neighboring wood for his relief. These were composed of the pepper root that grows spontaneously here, which being wetted with a vinegar and applied to the affected knee, produced a most violent external inflammation in a few hours. <laughs> this inflammation grew more angry for three or four days, eating away the flesh until it became necessary to apply healing poultices to extract the poison and fire. From that moment, the room of it Rheumatic pains began to abate, and he again set off for James Mitchell. <laughs> um, so be careful what you wish for. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna we're gonna see a series here after Benjamin Whiteman of the uh, uh, the, the classic old white men, I guess, uh, uh, who are involved in the history here. This man, uh, Martin Baum is a key figure in the development around Yellow Springs, and he never lived here. Uh, he is reported to be the first millionaire in Cincinnati. Um, he, through um, um, selling goods, basically, he was not a storekeeper, but on, on a, a larger level. Um, and, and he uh, apparently uh, bought the property here about 1810. This was just only one of his uh, speculations. He owned the property, would go to his daughter that would eventually become John Bryan Park. He owned the property that would go to his son, uh, David Baum, that became Whitehall Farm. 
And uh, he himself is probably best known for his legacy that he only lived in for a year or two, which is what's now the Taft Museum in Cincinnati. That was the house he built until he lost it because of all of his real estate speculations to the Bank of the United States, which uh, also played a role here. Um, so he, he uh, Martin Baum, buys the property, perhaps still in partnership with um, uh, Whiteman or Whiteman's son, as we'll find out. The records aren't really very clear. And uh, brought in the, the what would become the next tavern keeper at the Springs, a man by the name of J.B. Gardner. Now, J.B. Gardner decided to expand things and, and uh, make it uh, more... Uh, more of a popular attraction, uh, not just for the Medicinal Springs, but as a place to stay in the summertime. And he placed ads in numerous newspapers, and I actually have one of them back there if you haven't had a chance to look at it on the counter. It's an 1823 advertisement on the front page of the Columbus Gazette of the, uh, his commodious mansion that he's fixed up at the Yellow Springs uh, to, to um, receive people. The only one little problem, uh, he said, that he hadn't yet been able to uh, set up tepid baths, but he thought the cold baths worked just as well. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, what happens next is that Whiteman, well, not so much Whiteman, but um, uh, Baum started having financial problems. And uh, again, we think it's probably mostly because of his, his uh, real estate speculations. You know, the, the property didn't advance in value as, as quickly as uh, he would have liked, and the loans he took uh, from various sources to pay for that property, including the U.S. government, uh, didn't uh, uh, come through as well. So he first tries to sell the property, the Yellow Springs property, on land contract to a group. Um, uh, known as the Owenites, mm -hmm. and they came in in 1825 under land contract, so they didn't actually get title to the property. They agreed, they paid some up front, uh, they agreed to pay more, um, it were, <laughs> they, mostly from Cincinnati, uh, mostly of the Swedeborgian uh, church membership, but they were uh, followers of, of um, uh, Robert Owen, the, the British um, social commentator uh, who had advocated um, uh, communal living, among other things. And they built a um, bunkhouse or, or large house on the, on the west side of the Cascades. Uh, so on the other side of where the springs, on the other side of the ridge there where the springs are, and almost immediately started uh, uh, fighting with each other. Uh, there, was, there was tension because most of them had been middle class or upper middle class in Cincinnati. They really weren't used to working at things like farming and, and that sort of thing. And, and so within a year, they were starting to break up. Uh, they couldn't pay the second uh, installment of, uh, of the uh, land contract they owed to uh, Baum. And uh, so Baum searches around with prodding by the Bank of the United States, who was about ready to take the property from them, but I don't think they really wanted it either. Uh, and so who came to the rescue but a, a um, uh, and this is, I do not have a picture of, of him, but this is as close as we can come. Uh, a man by the name of, a Connecticut lawyer by the name of uh, Elisha Mills. Now, you got to watch these Connecticut lawyers because <laughs> they've, got a, they've got a reputation. But he'd been wandering around in the West. I mean, he'd, been, he'd gone out to Illinois. He was down in Cincinnati. He may have uh, been involved in pork packing in Cincinnati, but um, he was always looking for the next thing to do. And and next investment. In fact, uh, before I'll, I'll forget if I don't say it now. In the 1850, so when a lot of the story is is slowing down, 1850 census, 
when you look at Elisha Mills name and it, occupation, he's listed as speculator. So, <laughs> so I guess he was proud of it. But uh, he bought the property, the Yellow Springs tract, for $6,135, uh, about $9 an acre. Uh, and his son, uh, William, who's whose portrait we've got here, uh, remembered it in the 1870s. He was remembering back as being mostly log buildings um, that when uh, Southerners, particularly from Kentucky, came up in the summer to get to someplace cooler, they'd often bring their own uh, tents um, and uh, uh, so the, the, the accommodations were still fairly rough. But the, the, um, the Mills family is going to bring on the golden age of the resort in uh, Yellow Springs. And this, this is a painting. We have to actually, uh, Sharon and I found this at an auction in upstate New York uh, maybe 10 years ago. And on the back of it, it just says, on the road to the Yellow Springs, Greene County, Ohio, oh, wow. Farnsworth re uh, residence, painted by Mr. Lee, 1833. Wow. And so, lots of, lot, uh, great, great uh, chance for some research to find out the story about it. And I found out a great deal about it. This is roughly, um, if you think of this being what's today, 68, and going back where the boy and the lady are walking as being uh, sort of 343, except 343 had a different alignment. It more followed the river at that point. It wasn't 343, it was a Clifton Road, but it followed the river until Turnpike was built in 1841. And so let's just, but what's, what's interesting here is if you look down that road, you see uh, what I'm pretty certain is uh, the resort, the hotel at the Yellow Springs. And we'll see why. Noted, one thing to notice, pretty particular, see the low part in the middle and the two higher parts on the end. That low part in the middle was the, the really large dining room in the place. And so it, uh, uh, back here a second. Uh, <coughs> I'm almost, and, and the painting's titled On the Road to to the, uh, to the Yellow Springs. And in fact, um, Farnsworth was a Cincinnati printer. He printed the first Cincinnati city directory. He had to get permission from the city council to go around and number the houses because they'd never been, so nobody had street numbers before he put this uh, directory together uh, in 1819. Uh, Farnsworth uh, moves to Yellow Springs and he uh, somehow, and I really don't know the answer to it, he, uh, he takes this cabin on a, or a cottage on a, on a life estate so he can, he can have the use of it for life. Um, he actually started a newspaper, the first newspaper in Yellow Springs, which as far as I know, there are no traces of, 1830, 1833. He was the postmaster of Yellow Springs at, at one point. And, I found an account in 1830 of Henry Clay's visit to the, uh, the hotel. And one evening at, at, during that visit, they had a barbecue in the front yard of this uh, cottage. Um, and Japanese lanterns in the, in the uh, trees and, and banners uh, um, welcoming Henry Clay and several hundred, uh, several hundred people. But um, uh, that house eventually went through several different owners, eventually decayed. Uh, Thomas Neff, or excuse me, Ted, Theodore Neff built his house on it, and that house was still standing, built his house on the foundation. That house was still standing, and I think the Township Fire Department burned it down sometime after, I, in the 90s, late 90s, I think, sometime after I lived in Yellow Springs. But let me talk a little bit about what the mills did to the, uh, to the resort. They built six cottages that were 50 by 24, uh, adding 48 rooms, 
they built the dining room, the, in, the, the section in between, which was 24 feet by 100 feet, so very large. They had gardens with walks and shrubbery, um, a billiard house, uh, two nine pin bowling alleys they added, bathing houses, a uh, spring house, an ice house. There was a store, um, uh, although in, when they um, uh, were advertising it in 1829, they said, all games of hazard, um, skill or exercise will be indulged only as helpful and innocent amusements and not as gambling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, William Mills, writing in, in 1873, said, uh, <laughs> recall sort of these days, and I'm talking about Sundays in particular, he said, there being no houses of worship here, Sunday became a sort of gala day, and the skilled riflemen for miles around made the springs a general rendezvous, where amid other athletic sports, the chief amusement was that of target shooting. The open wood lawn furnished a most delightful playground, while the large trunks of the noble old trees were scarified with bullet holes, producing a mark and rough and surface discernible at this late day in the, in the 1870s. Each participant in the manly games of wrestling, running, or as often the case, a personal combat was provided with a flask or jug filled with the celebrated Croft's whiskey, a distillery on Mad River, which infused a belligerent spirit in proportion to the frequency of their potations. Many a blackened eye and pools of the crimson fluid were the result of those Sabbath day encounters in that grand old park. Well, um, so I mentioned the bathhouses, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not. Whoops. But it just so happens because Farnsworth rented that cottage on a life estate, um, it was worth, normally you wouldn't record a lease in the recorder's office in Xenia. They recorded this lease in uh, Xenia, um, again, because it was a, uh, a life estate, I think. And part of the lease, and I, thought, I think this is pretty funny, it is further agreed that by the said mills that the said Oliver Farnsworth, his wife, uh, children, and family shall during the uh, continuance of this lease have the use of the waters of the Yellow Springs and the privilege of the bathhouse at all times whenever it shall not interfere with the visitors at the hotel, uh, said Farnworth and family always furnishing their own towels, napkins, and other uh, necessities. <laughs> so, so you're welcome to come and use the, uh, the bathhouse and the springs, but bring your own, uh, uh, bring your own towels. So um, that visit by Henry Clay, trying to figure out how many people could stay at the, at the hotel at the springs. Um, he mentions that, or this article I found mentions that they had dinner so the mills kept having to add tables, add boards or something at the end of the dining room table to accommodate all the, uh, uh, the people that came for dinner that 195 people sat down for uh, dinner that day with Henry Clay at the hotel, uh, out of which 30 or 40 were uh, ladies who provided highly additional interest. So, <laughs> um, well, I don't think that um, I, I don't think that Mills was really into running the property, and in fact, what he uh, what he did was he, he rented it in uh, 1832 to um, a man by the name of Gregory who um, who operated it. And I don't know whether it was because uh, Elisha was, was a speculator and so this was just another speculation who was going to try to make money for him, or whether he was having some other financial problems. Because in 1841, he sold it to, uh, and, and I'm, I'm just going to show where we are at each one of these things. In 1841, he sold it to a man by, William, uh, by the name of William Neff who was a pork packer from Cincinnati, who was very wealthy. Uh, he paid $15,000, uh, so Mills made good money on it, uh, but he put into it uh, for, the, uh, for the 160 acres, and it was only 160 acres. The rest of the property the Mills continued to own, and we'll come back to, uh, we'll come back to them in a, in a little bit. 
but one of the things that, that um, Neff brought, and Neff is probably the name most associated with the, the subsequent hotels, and we'll go through those in a minute, but um, uh, he brought along a man by the name of Frank Hafner. Frank Hafner uh, was a baker, and he managed the hotel at the Springs, and when uh, he would eventually move from the Springs into what became Yellow Springs when um, William Mills laid it out, and had a, a cabin that he did his baking on, and that cabin, that the log house that he did the baking in, is now the back of the um, uh, old trail. And, and it wasn't built in 1827, more like 1844. So we're gonna, uh, now we've got the Neffs owning it. This is the first view I found published any place. This is from an 1852 book on <coughs> the uh, uh, railroads in southwest Ohio, basically. But this is the end of the, of the hotel where it uh, overlooks the valley, and the, the, so the springs are at that level as well. So probably a little dramatic, like that, that hill in the background, I don't, or not, <laughs> I don't really rec uh, recognize. <laughs> And then this comes in the 1855 county map, uh, the big wall map. And so uh, William Neff had actually died the year before, uh, but it, um, it's, it's great to see. And at this point, he had, tur had closed it for tourists and um, uh, was just using it as a summer residence. But then shortly after he died in 1854, his uh, son, also named William Neff, uh, reopened it as a as a hotel, but you can see see the the notch in the building there, uh, which showed up on that painting from 1833, and this little building down on the left corner is uh, over the springs as the spring house, and you can see the the various cottages that um, Mills had built, and so we're lucky because a few years later in uh, the late 18, or excuse me, mid 1860s, about the time of the Civil War, um, a Cincinnati photographer took a number of photographs of the area, and those are in Antiochiana. Uh, this is the entry lane from, this had to be extended when they built the, um, William Mills, by the way, built the uh, turnpike to Clifton, uh, because that was farther away than the old road had been, but this is the entrance road. There you can see the the end and this and how it's it's raised. That was actually at one point uh, William Mills and his his new brides uh, they had added that on for their residence. And then the low part where the dining hall was. This was a 200 feet long promenade along the. Uh, they're in the spring, little spring house down there, you can see. Another view on down the, the length of the, the building. And this is looking back towards the springs, towards town, if you will. Uh, and you can see how, how long that was on, on, the, uh, uh, on the slope. There's, there's some of the cottages. Um, let me just take it. I apologize for reading, but I think some of these are really um, good um, explanations of what was going on. There were, in 1838, there was a, a writer from Cincinnati by the name of Benjamin Drake, and he published a book of short stories, basically. Um, not sure whether there's any truth to them or not. One of them, uh, but, but there's clearly based on some experience. One of them is, is called the, Gro Gro it's, huh, the Grave of Rosalie, and it, go, it, it pulls in a whole lot. But the first part of the story is talking about, and, and he's setting the scene. The scene is going to be in Clifton, but uh, the, his, his writer, who's never named, is coming to, um, a, um, uh, to stay at the, at the Neff House at the Yellow Springs. Uh, 
my truck being, uh, actually this was probably, it may still have been when the mill zoned it, but my truck being packed, I was soon seated in a luxurious co coach in Cincinnati and moving onward at the rate of seven miles per hour. The steeples and domes of the Queen City were soon lost to the view as we ascended the valley of Deer Creek. That's more or less where 71 comes up out of the valley. An hour's ride brought us to the breakfast house, merry and hungry, even as the birds which were singing and catching spiders in the surrounding woods. There is a delightful exhilaration of the spirits in stagecoach traveling. This was obviously a nice day. As the bracing air of a spring morning kisses one's temple, and he is suddenly whirled from the dust and drowsy hum of a city to the refreshing shades and Sabbath serenity of the country. Our party, seven in number, were too polite not to do ample justice to the fragrant coffee and hot rolls that garnished the breakfast table. This necessary duty performed, we resumed our seats in so cheerful a mood that Sharon, Palmyra, Lebanon, all more beautiful in name than appearance, were, <laughs> <laughs> were successively, successively passed without a complaint, even though the ladies of the rough roads and occasional sloughs of despond over which and through which they were dragged. The sun was far down in the west when the twanging horn of the driver called out the dogs and the postmaster of Xenia, a village whose loitering population and quiet streets gave evidence of more content than commerce. <laughs> uh, the departing rays of a brilliant sunset were upon the tops of the old oaks that rise around the Yellow Springs when the stage reached that romantic spot. As we drove up to the door, the eyes of numerous company of visitors were turned upon us. Some were sitting on the piazzas, others sauntering to the spring or promenading over the green turf of the lawn in front of the hotel, all waiting with philosophical patience the, the welcome tinkle of a huge triangle by which the major domo, domo of the kitchen cabinet was wont to announce that the tea, chickens, and pancakes were on the supper table. After breakfast the following morning, there was, as usual, a general conference of the ladies to select the best means of killing the forenoon. After a copious flow of small talk, the blue stockings retired to their respective cottages to pour over the new novel and the last review. Those of the single sisterhood, whose code of ethics embraced flirtation as a pastime, <laughs> rambled to Lover's Lane and Pompey's Pillar. And incidentally, this 1838 reference is the first we, I know of to Pompey's Pillar. Or sought the evergreen and the wild rose on the bristling cliff. A third and less sentimental class accompanied the followers of old Isaac down to West Branch to angle for fish or cross the lawn for a game of nine pins, while those opposed to locomotion sat down upon the piazza to cards and chess. The gentlemen, as is their wont, attached themselves to the ladies and partook of their sports and rambles. <laughs> he goes on to talk about how he, um, he managed to beat out three other young men for the uh, company of a woman on a horse who, uh, and then they went to, they saw a, a grave at the bottom of Clifton Gorge, which is the rest of the story. So just to put it this in context, at this time, it wasn't the only hotel in the area. This is, this is one that still survives, the 1833 Stagecoach Hotel in Clifton. Um, so, but, but these other hotels were mostly um, uh, housing travelers, traveling salesmen, traveling uh, folks for some other reason, whereas the, the hotel at the Springs was really a destination. This is a... Uh, a map which is in Antiochiana, which is a doctored copy of a map that supposedly was in the Neff family. I'd love to see the original because uh, this was done by a man by the name of Galloway, who I think put some modern um, modern ideas on it. But you can see the, the the long building in the center is the hotel, and the and just right below it the springs. And then all the gardens that all ran all the way out to the Clifton Pike, the two uh, barns that were set off, we'll, we'll see one of them in a minute, um, the Indian Mound, which we'll hear about later on uh, this, this uh, fall, and, and gardens, orchards, and uh, I think the old road was, was this road that's coming in from the middle top to the gardens, and I, 
Uh, don't know for a fact, but I think the, the house that shows up on there may be the Farnsworth house. And this is a, a, a really unusual photograph. Um, Don Hustler, who grew up in Yellow Springs and was a uh, curator for the uh, Ohio Historical Society for his career, found this in the Smithsonian. It's the oldest known tintype photograph, the form of uh, photograph on <coughs> iron sheets, varnish on iron sheets. And it's labeled, it's it, the earliest documented, and I guess I should say, it's labeled Tom the Boy at Yellow Springs, Yellow Springs, 1855, January. Um, and the, there were two guys uh, who got the patent for the, the doing photographs on iron sheets. One of them was Peter Neff. And Peter Neff was, fu was uh, uh, funded by his uh, cousin, William Neff, who owned the hotel after his, the first William Neff died. So that is, the thought is that's a poor, he, Tom was a porter working at the hotel in 1855. So really the earliest documented photograph we've got of somebody who was, who was working there then. Uh, it's, it's really pretty amazing. Is Tom black? Just Tom. Oh no, is Tom black? I do not think so. Is he Irish? But I, but see, this is a this is a third generation photograph. I someday I'll I'll, I'll try to get uh, a good copy from the Smithsonian. This is this is a, a photocopy of a printed copy. So, but it, it's, it's certainly possible he was, but I, I don't I don't think so. So, just a few views around the around the uh, area. So now this is. You know, those cliffs are, <laughs> cliffs are still there, but you wouldn't be uh, standing there. This is probably the, earl the earliest known photograph I have of, uh, of Pompey's Pillar, uh, taken by a photographer who was working in Yellow Springs in the 1860s, so probably about that time. This one was taken by a visitor in the 1890s, which is called Rocky Pillar of Yellow Springs and people standing on it, which... Uh, the, the Cascades, this is, this is documented because it has a tax stamp on the back of it. It was taken between late 1864 and 1866. We know that by a Cincinnati photographer, uh, who I think may have been the same photographer that took those other views that we, we saw. But pretty cool view of the Cascades. And it's on display just over there. Yeah, it's in the case over there, that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, the livery stable that the Neffs built. Well, it looks like the end of Nay Hall. <laughs> in, in less happy days. But you can see the, still has the, and there's a sign inside that pointing to Billiard's stairs. The, the stagecoach road. Um, Obviously, it was, this was after the turnpike had been built, wasn't being used anymore, but it's amazing what you can fix up if you're a huge tail of birch. There it is after the, so, so just look at that. Yeah. That's what was left. That just shows you can restore anything if you want to do it. <laughs> so that's just, just some views of the, um, of the hotel. So now we're going to, we're going to skip back in time and skip back to the Mills family. So they sold the property to the Neffs in 1841, but um, Elisha had moved upstream and built a house for himself at the crossing of um, Yellow Springs Creek and the, uh, the Dayton-Columbus Road, which or, or we call it today uh, Dayton Springfield Road, or even Xenia. Uh, and what he, when, when the, the Neffs shut down the hotel, Mills, being the, the speculator entrepreneur that he was, started taking guests at his house. And that expanded 
and expanded and expanded. Um, and so while his son, um, William Mills, was laying out the village of Yellow, what becomes the village of Yellow Springs, where it is today, and building his house in the middle of, of town in uh, what had been a swamp, um, Elisha, and you can still see the front part of his house, decided to really turn his home into a, uh, uh, another hotel. And this, this hotel was known, with a couple of exceptions during the years, as the Yellow Springs House. Another, and it, was, it was another resort hotel. People came to stay to enjoy uh, the sports and activities or just leisure. Uh, it, it wasn't far from the, from the springs. There's another view of it. They eventually, because uh, um, they were getting so many people, built a, another row of uh, co separated cottages down below. So this is roughly where the Bryan Center is? It's, it is where the Bryan Center is, yeah. Uh, and and I'll, I'll actually get to that in a minute, but there you can see it laid out. And it's, it's sort of hard to envision because the, the, the roads were changed. So now you, you feel like Xenia Avenue is going straight north to Springfield. In fact, Xenia Avenue dead ended into, into Dayton Street originally. And then you made the turn to, to, to Springfield. So it's a, it's a little bit different. It, it, it takes it working your mind around that a little bit. But you get an idea of what this is from the 1895 Sanborn fire insurance map. You get a little bit of an idea of what the hotel was like. This is a, a great view uh, coming up the Springfield Pike with the horses and the, uh, the trees that have been cut. But look at the at the Yell Springs house. One of the only photographs I know of the, of the main Yell Springs house. This is from Antioch, Indiana. This is, now remember, 68 was raised and then cut at the top of the hill to take out what had been a big uh, dip to go across the creek. This is before that, so this is down at almost a creek level. There was a bridge, a stone bridge, uh, looking up the creek. So you can see a bridge across the, uh, to, to uh, where the home ink houses are now on Cemetery Street in the cottages in the back of the, of the hotel. There's another view. This is, the cottages outlasted the hotel, and this is probably about 1910. But see, the, there was a pond that was a dam across the creek that created a small pond there for the guests, the hotel. The, the remnants of that are really clear if you go down by the amphitheater and down in that area. There's a, that area today. Maybe this is a little bit better. There you can see the remains of the dam. And one of the little decorative ponds that was there. And there's the, there's the stone bridge. It was built as part of the Clifton Turnpike, but uh, uh, over, over Yellow Springs Creek. And you know, now it's just a culvert down way below. Um, So the mills didn't own didn't own this land for very long, um, or this hotel. In 1854, Elisha Mills sold it to. Uh, so he operated it from uh, at least through the 1840s and beginning of the 1850s. Sold it to this man Moses Grinnell uh, for fifty thousand dollars. Moses Grinnell is an interesting. We could have a program on Moses Grinnell sometime. He was a, a president of the board of Antioch College. He uh, was a partner in one of the largest shipping companies in the world, based in, in uh, New York. Uh, he bought and operated uh, probably the most famous clipper ship that was ever built, the Flying Cloud, that had the uh, uh, sailing speed record from New York to, Los An or to uh, San Francisco for I think 110 years. It was, it, it was, 
uh, it stood. And he was a, another real estate speculator and speculated in real estate around Yellow Springs, including this, uh, the Yellow Springs house. Um, he obviously didn't come here to operate it. And really, this started a, a series of different operators. And it's, it's a little unclear, and I've never done the real estate record search to figure out who, who actually owned the property and who just leased it to operate. But it went through a whole series of operators. Uh, Joshua Francis, E.P. Johnson, D.C. King. I got There's a card, and that's back there, too. Uh, he actually changed the name. But that only lasted for about two years. Uh, Harvey Graham, W.H. Grove, T.S. Cassad, A.T. Gross, uh, Judge Ingalls, Ed Clark, who was the Yell Springs grocer, uh, all at different times, um, different times owned or operated it. And you read in the papers. I mean, there were sleighing parties to the to the uh, Yell Springs house in uh, 1869. Uh, when the, uh, at that point, world famous Cincinnati Reds came to the Yellow Springs to play the uh, Antioch baseball team, they stayed at the Yellow Springs house. And there's an account of that. Um, and, and not all the, the operators were, were perfect people. There was a general, H.A. Gilbert, who uh, had opened it up in 1878 and he was arrested uh, uh, for uh, forging checks, basically. <laughs> like it's twenty-five thousand dollars worth of uh, uh, checks, uh, which was a lot of money at the time. Uh, in 1891, it was remodeled to uh, 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 to be a hundred rooms, so it was a it was a good-sized facility. Uh, by a, a group that was the Yellow Springs Hotel Company, and I think I've got a, a ledger back there that shows uh, that I bought at the Cahoe auction years ago that uh, uh, shows the furniture that was in each room of the hotel at the time, sort of accounts for it. Um, and Ed Clark was really the last one, the grocer was the last one to operate it, and I think things were, were, were getting tough. Um, as far as attracting people to Yellow Springs at that point. He just maybe should have waited 100 years but uh, <laughs> uh, for, um, for a resort type of hotel when you could take the railroad and go to Michigan or whatever. So in, in about 1899-1900, he sold it to the Methodist Church where it was the Methodist home for the aged, uh, a place for of old Methodist ministers to live. Um, and, and they lived there, and they lived there, and they were starting to build it up until 1902. In 1902, there was a big fire, and it burnt down. Nobody was hurt. Uh, they got everybody out. But um, uh, it was the end of it. And in fact, this, move, this um, home moved to Cincinnati after they were burned out here. And a very large building that you can still see from 75 in North, in North Cincinnati was uh, what resulted from that. They'd only had, uh, it said, about 21 uh, inmates at the, they call them inmates, <laughs> <laughs> at the time of the fire. And good old uh, Yell Springs Fire Department had a hand pumper, but it couldn't, the hose wasn't long enough to get from the hydrant in Dayton Street, so they couldn't put any water on it, so it, it just burned. Now we're going to take a real quick trip, trip because I don't know if you consider this a resort, resort hotel or not. But to the to uh, further down the glen, uh, to the water cure, and the water cure was a hotel built 1848, 1849, um, and it was it was there for helping people to recover uh, from illnesses by using water therapy. Uh, water therapy um, could be baths. In fact, there's a there, Antioch Anna has a letter from a lady written about her treatment at the uh, the baths um, in the middle of the winter. Cold baths, warm baths, cold baths, warm baths, and it sounded like the the treatment, like at least in her case, 
she was glad to go home. She was going to make herself feel better, uh, regardless. Um, here's a picture of that hotel. Um, in 1853, it was enlarged to hold 100 patrons. And the reason I wonder if it wasn't starting to move away from water treatment and more into resort is they, they built a, a bowling saloon, what they call it, a gymnasium, a swimming pool. Uh, here too, like uh, uh, Farnsworth, you had to bring your own sheets or they'd charge you 50 cents a extra. <laughs> and of course, the most famous uh, occupants of this uh, place, uh, a, a Dr. Ehrman from Cincinnati bought it and then leased it to Dr. T. L. and Mary S. Go Nichols. Uh, who uh, had certainly advocated free love at one time or another, and uh, the question of whether they were really doing that here, uh, they named this Memnonia, uh, by the way, at that point. But the uh, people like Horace Mann, I guess, didn't want to take any chances of the college students being uh, <laughs> affected by these radical uh, ideas, and so they basically ran the nickels out of town. And it, uh, this operated for a few more years. It was really converted to an inn. I mean, it, was, it gave up any pretense of water cure, but the water cure uh, concept had had um, had died off a little bit. Uh, and it, anyway, and it was destroyed by fire completely in 1862 during the Civil War. Where was it located? Uh, hold on a second. So there's the college, there's the bike path or the railroad, and it was in the, in the south part of the North Glen, I guess is the way I'd describe it, before you get to Grinnell Road. If, if you count the streets, it's three blocks south of Herman Street. Okay. There you go. Right. And those, the, those streets don't the exist. Side. The blocks. The stream, river. Oh, is it so steep there? It's sort of below the school forest. And they actually brought water from springs on the hillside down to the to the hotel. Okay, so now we got to go back again, real quick, to uh, to the North Glen, to the uh, uh, Neff House. When so the Neffs trying to figure out what to do, they decided they needed to modernize. And the way they modernized was to raise $100,000. Yell Springs cooked, kicked in $3,000 at the very end to get up to it. And they built what they called the new Nav House. Now look at the size of that uh, building. So mostly, mo uh, mostly money from Cincinnati. It was called the, the company they formed was the Yell Springs Watering Place Company. <laughs> So there's, we're lucky because there's a whole series of uh, photographs, uh, stereo views, that were taken at the, the Great Summer Resort in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And most of these, probably late 1870s, early 1880s. There's a little um, pamphlet that was um, uh, um, issued in the year after they opened it. They opened, they finally, they started building in 1869, mostly local contractors, and in 1870, June of 1870, they opened it in the old historic Neff House, the one that went, dated back to, in parts to 1804, was torn down at the time. Uh, they claimed it was the largest frame building in the state. There was some question about whether they used cured lumber to build it, because apparently it started warping pretty quick. Um, it was 50 by 150 feet long. It manufactured, they had a plant to manufacture their own lighting gas. Um, um, they had plans to put what would eventually be put in the lake, but it hadn't been put, they didn't get it put in. And there was gonna be a arch bridge at the end of it to, to lead from the hotel to the, to the railroad station. There aren't any photographs that show the front, probably because it was so big. This is a blow-up of a stereo view that may be back there, but uh, 
you can see with the two towers. It was it it was a big it was a big building. And uh, here's so it had um, the, just just some statistics about it. <coughs> Uh, 150 feet, the L was 150 feet, it was 350, 300 feet altogether, 45 feet wide, three stories, uh, 246 sleeping rooms, 11 parlors, a dining room that was 72 feet by 45 feet, and they were proud of their chickering grand piano that they had in there, a steam laundry, a separate dining room that was 160 by 50 feet, um, the furniture was described, and I've never seen a photograph inside the hotel. Plain black walnut furniture, spring mattresses, and carpeted throughout. A uh, hundred stalls in the livery stables. A, separate, a dairy barn with 20 cows for the providing milk. Um, a bowling alley, ballroom, um, uh, a separate two-story two uh, label. And this little, that book I showed you. Uh, refer, it says, and it's, it is within walking distance of the village of Yellow Springs, which is as pretty as one as there is outside of England. <laughs> there's a, not much surviving from this place, but there's a, a sugar bowl that it was uh, cheap tin coated with silver, uh, silver plated. Here, you can see in the background, this is the springs. Uh, the, the columns from the hotel, so that gives you an idea of where it was. So the, if the uh, old Nap House is running east and west, this is running north and south, sort of perpendicular to the, to the, uh, there's some visitors. People were still able to, I don't know why you would set up the tent in, on the grounds. Um, when you could see it at the hotel, but maybe could have been. There's the, you know, for 200 years, tourists have been violating the rules and yes. <laughs> <laughs> going where they shouldn't be. There's not much water at that point. This was in the 1890s. So this this is one of these stereo views that that uh, were taken by the Gano and Clark and sold by a guy named Large here in Yellow Springs. Um, basically, the the New Nap House was was a flop. It was mismanaged and never got off to a good start. Then they had a couple of good seasons, but again, they're competing with. Um, you could take a train to the beach or you could take a train to northern Michigan and so it just wasn't quite the same thing. Um, in 1882 uh, um, it was shut down. In 1892 the lumber was sold uh, at auction and it was sent to Cincinnati. Um, so this picture with these oxen and, and this is Yellow Springs, uh, in Yellow Springs you see the glen off the background. I don't know whether this is a picture of the lumber being hauled to build the place or the lumber being hauled away when it was torn down, but it, I'm sure uh, it's one of the two. It's not labeled. Uh, you know, it was torn down in 1892. Uh, but in uh, uh, Frank Hafner had offered in the paper in 1882 when they first shut it down that everything in the hotel was for sale in quantities to suit the purchaser. So uh, they had a lot of everything. And, and it's surprising that not much survives, um, you know, given the, um, uh, given how much of it was. So I, I want to, we're back, we're still there. Uh, Neff House has been torn down. What, both Neff Houses have been torn down at this stage. So what happens in this space? It's not really a resort hotel, but Theodore Neff, the next generation down of the Neff family, decides there's got to be something I can do with this property. Um, and I'll, um, uh, so he buys it back from the, the hotel company. 
and he opens it in 1902 as a um, uh, picnic grounds and pleasure resort. And he built a, a dining hall at the Springs. Um, and I just, so the last really use before it became Glen was as the Neff Park. And just to run through a few, here's a popular place uh, to take the interurban to. There was a, a station right, right there by the dance hall. There was a dance hall on the west side of the creek. Uh, you could get to from that. Um, show you. So you can see going back from the stop. On, this is right on 68 uh, the, with the uh, interurban. Uh, you can go back to the dance hall from there. Gives you an idea of where it was. There's a picture of the sidewalk. There's a picture of the sidewalk a few years ago. It's still there. Um, the dance hall. The dance hall burnt once and was rebuilt, uh, took the lumber and rebuilt it the second, wait, I'm sorry. It burnt once, it was rebuilt, and then when it was finally torn down, uh, the lumber was used to build some of the buildings uh, at the outdoor education center. There's the dam, which now has a walkway across the top. And so the lake was very popular. See some pictures of the lake. This is referred to as a bathing beach, which uh, a little rough. <laughs> I, Kenny Campbell, who used to be on a, a trustee of the Historical Society years ago, uh, talks about as a kid they would open both doors to this um, bath or this boathouse and sled in the winter down. <laughs> And the, the object was to go through the doors, out into the lake, and as far across the ice as you could go where they hold you, I guess. Jeez. So that's, that's, that's even titled Bathing Beach over there. So it's a little rough, but... <laughs> Another view from across the lake of the, of the uh, dance hall. So this is a little farther up, on the, down at the level of the lake. Gives you an idea of what the lake was like. That's where the dance hall was. Okay, we got one more to go. One more resort hotel to go. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> brings us up to the current time. And uh, it's 19, or excuse me, 20, I think it says 2015, but it didn't know until 2016, so. And here's the Mills house that it was built to resemble. And so I just want to run through a few pictures here of tourists over the years. Enjoying the scenery. There they are, Poppy Spiller, where they shouldn't be. Oh, yeah. Swimming in the Glen. So, real quick, a couple of, just to see the changes, the springs over the years. So, this is the earliest one I know, about 1865, with the spring house over the springs. This, is, this I think, is really interesting. There it is in the probably late 1870s, 1880s, the hotel behind it. There it is about 1910, postcard. There it is in the 1940s, and I can't quite figure out exactly what was done there in the 1940s. And then of course it was remodeled. And that's a that's a wasn't the remodeling also late 1940s? I thought it was late 1930s, but you may be right. I'm not positive about when the remodeling was done. It was in 1947. Perfect. I learned to walk there when my mother was designing the spring. Ah, it is now. Cool. Great. 
cascades, the poppy spiller, and I just want to end up with a, with reading one more thing from William Mills, but I think it's a it's a fitting end to all this. Assuming I still got it here someplace. So William Mills had been, you know, very successful early on. Had um, spent put a lot of effort into laying out Yellow Springs. He laid it out. He spent twenty thousand dollars and gave land away to attract Antioch College here. He went to Boston and sold bonds to um, uh, attract the Little Miami Railroad. He built a spec uh, three-story industrial building to attract the industry, uh, which, which burnt um, during the Civil War. And he lost everything, basically. In, uh, he was put out of his house in uh, the middle of town uh, during the 1860s. He, he joined the Army because he really didn't have much of anything else to do uh, during the Civil War, and then ended up going out and selling real estate in the, um, uh, out in Illinois, I think, and then came back in the 1870s, really didn't have a place, didn't have much of anything going on anymore, but he had all these memories. And so he went around speaking, and here is, um, here is how he, he ended up one of his talks. So he, 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 he was going on about a, a, a lawsuit that his father had been involved with, Tom Corwin um, uh, represented him, but um, but Destiny ordered otherwise, and thousands upon thousands, they were, they were trying to shut the place down, basically, because of the Sunday activities. But mm -hmm. Destiny ordered otherwise, and thousands upon thousands in Miami Valley have enjoyed many a merry season there since. And if the isolated rocks and old Pompey's pillar could reveal the delicate secrets of Cupid's artful wiles <laughs> in that heart-confiding, lovely retreat, what crimson flushes might yet mantle the still fair cheeks of many an honored, excellent dame? How sweet their memory still. But I won't expose what the rocks refuse to tell. Let the singing cascade ever murmur on her soothing melodies of the delightful and happy past. May untold generations rise up and call the place blessed. <laughs> Any questions? Yep. I went to the Historical Society in Price Hill, on the west side of Cincinnati, where the Neff Mansion was. Uh -huh. And I ran across an article that spoke of the Neff family buying three tracts for raising pigs. And one of the three tracts was, wait, what? What you described. Yeah. And they sort of, as a footnote, referenced the attraction of the spring, and then when the railroad came in, they would go up on weekends. So is there any evidence of pigs being raised? That's, that's the first I have heard of pigs. Um, but Neff, William Neff, first William Neff, so he had made his money in uh, pork packing, but at some point he, he basically retired here. And in the 1850 census, the same one where William Mills is listed as a uh, speculator, uh, he listed himself as agriculturalist. And so he was clearly sort of a hobby farmer. And I, I've got some accounts from Ohio agricultural magazines where he writes in with you know, tips on raising uh, uh, fruit trees or different things like that. Never saw him mention the pigs. but. That'd be interesting to follow up and do some big research on. The only thing that would make me wonder is there were Osage Orange hedges through right. the Glen. Right. Why? Yeah. Is that some other pasture? Yeah, that makes sense. Don't know? Mm -hmm. could, could well be. We have Osage Oranges up along 68, too. So. Mm -hmm. Could have been the dairy cows. Yeah, could have been. That might be more likely. These these large hotels took an architect, they took a lot of materials, and they took an immense amount of labor. With 
What was the size of the village? Where did all the it, um, it, it was not, come from? Yeah, it wasn't very big, and and um, we've got the list of the contractors who were names you recognize in county history or for local history uh, that that built the the big nap house, the new nap house. Uh, never run across much of anybody who was doing it on the uh, the old nap house, and you know we we've got like the King family who were who had brick yards and, and did some of that in town. So just little bits and pieces. And, and going back to the really early history, it's it's really, really difficult to find anything. And I mean, the, the newspapers weren't really operating yet. And um, you just have to get lucky to find just a little teeny bit of information. The real estate records are all messed up. And, it seems like a huge undertaking. It was. It was. Yeah. Dave? Yes. When uh, I was in botany class in Antioch, where I graduated in 1971, um, I was in class with Walt Tulecki, and there was some reference to the uh, eventuality of the glen having to be replanted with the native wildflowers because it had been the, all they had all been decimated by the pigs. Oh, that's interesting. And so there was a name of a person who took on this project uh, in long ago times of Semmelweiss, who was an area person who uh, maybe it was after the Glen had been given to Antioch, um, had uh, plantings of uh, native wildflowers that he transplanted back into likely spots in the Glen. That would be interesting to follow up on. It's interesting that what's now a nature preserve is has had 200 years of, of fairly intensive use. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Where is that big old lake? That you showed us in some of the well, the, the dam is still there. You can walk across the dam now, but yeah. the but the lake um, and I sh I don't have my notes on it, but it's it it went out a couple of times over the years. It, it just the dam broke basically. What? The dam broke and dam broke. Okay. And, and never rebuilt. There were there were actually at one point three lakes on Yell Springs Creek. There was the big one at the um, Neff House, then there was a smaller one at the Yellow Springs House, and then there was what's now DeWine's Pond that was a water supply for our house, so um, it, it was it was dammed up three places at one time. Okay, thanks. Just uh, an aside, we didn't really have the uh, Yellow Springs on the south end of town. It was not a hotel, but that's why we need to add well, that motel. Well, there, and there were other travelers' uh, hotels. There was the Hunster House, which was popular for a long time, but it was more travelers. And then I, I think it may have been the same building, but it, at one time it was advertised as the Cascades House, uh, which sounds really exotic, and I think they were trying to make it into a a little bit of a resort hotel, but that only shows up in advertisements that I found one or two years. So, um, so there are other places to stay. Or you can go over to Clifton and stay in the, the brick hotel. In the 1920s, the building that houses the, the hardware store was known as Comfort Inn. And uh, in the 1920s, uh, that was converted to a traveler's inn, but uh, when the guys came back from the Second World War, it all turned into housing, housing basically. Yeah. And, and still is, some of that still. It, it used to be all three stories of, yeah. of extremely poor students. <laughs> <laughs> My parents and uh, the Surlings lived across the way above the theater. And so, so. Other questions? Well, enjoy some refreshments and thanks for coming out. Oh, okay. yeah.